Do we have the other? Ivy? It doesn't sound like, oh, there we go. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, my name is Susan Etner, and I'm the Dean of Graduate Education at UCLA. Um, welcome. We're thrilled to see all of you here tonight. Um, so I would like to begin by first recognizing that as a land-grant institution, UCLA acknowledges the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, Los Angeles Basin, South Channel Islands. I would also like to remind everyone to please keep your masks on while inside this ballroom and the Luskin Conference Center. We're very excited to have you here tonight um, for this final round of UCLA's 2022 Grad Slam competition. Tonight, we will select UCLA's winner, who will go on to compete for the title of UC Grad Slam champion at a University of California-wide competition on May 6th in San Francisco, California. Grad Slam showcases our extraordinary graduate students, giving you the chance to learn about their fascinating, innovative, and impactful research. We appreciate your coming here tonight to support these inspiring and brilliant scholars. After signing up and prior to the competition, the students participated in Grad Slam workshops that focused on identifying their topics, basic presentation skills, crafting their presentation, design principles for visual presentations, and small group coaching sessions. These activities afforded them the opportunity to build their skills while working with professional trainers and Grad Slam alumni. Flash forward to late February when the competition began, consisting of a qualifying video submission round. Altogether, 50 students competed this year, representing over 30 areas of study. About 86% were doctoral students and 14% were working toward their master's degrees. May I ask this year's finalists, as well as any other students who participated in our qualifying round, to please stand up as we applaud your efforts. We are here to commend and celebrate you tonight. Thank you. You'll find a list of everyone who entered the competition in the acknowledgments that you picked up at the door. Now tonight, we have 10 finalists. Their mission is to articulate their research to us in ways that are understandable, compelling, and engaging in three minutes or less. We have an outstanding panel of judges who will score each presentation based on the following criteria. Clarity, organization, delivery, visuals, appropriateness, intellectual significance, and engagement. The judges will award up to five points in each category for a total of 35 possible points. This year, we are excited to announce the prizes for each of our top finalists, thanks to the generosity of our donors. At third place, 
the winner will receive a $2,000 fellowship stipend. Our second place winner will receive a $3,000 fellowship stipend. The first place winner will receive a $5,000 fellowship stipend. But wait, there's more. Based on your votes, the audience choice winner will receive $1,000. And last but not least, our remaining finalists will each receive a $500 stipend fellowship. This brings us up to a total of $14,000 in cash prizes. Our goal is to build on the solid foundation of the Grad Slam program and grow even more, reaching more students and providing professional development opportunities for every area on campus. I next want to recognize our Grad Slam sponsors, Startup UCLA, UCLA Store, and then the following Grad Slam sponsors, all of whom are alumni of UCLA and have been a part of growing the Grad Slam program since it started in 2014. Charlie Steinmetz and Jerome and Randy Greenberg. Thank you very much. I also would like to take this opportunity to thank the core Grad Slam team for their hard work behind the scenes and here tonight to make this entire competition happen. Ivy Ebuan, just wave <laughs> wherever you are. I can't see you through the fog. <laughs> Samantha Tago. Jackie Suero, Christopher Sosa, and Pete Clues. Thank you. And lastly, the Grad Slam acknowledgments that you received on your way in list the more than 100 people and departments that helped make the 2022 Grad Slam workshops and competition possible. Many of those people are here tonight, both sitting in the audience and lending their time to make this event happen. Thank you so much to all of you for your contributions to this celebration of our graduate students' research. I now have the great pleasure of introducing my co-host, Francis Gimo, who is going to go over some details about the competition. Francis is a doctoral student in material science and engineering, and he is currently the president of the Graduate Student Association. Thank you, Dinetna. Good evening, everyone. Um, over time, the GSA has been an integral part of the Grad Slam, and we have more than a passing interest in this event. And so I want to once again say thank you to the Graduate Division for putting this together. Fun fact, my predecessor, um, a GSA president, of course, uh, was a one-time winner of this uh, Grad Slam. And so the GSA has an history with this event. Uh, we are very happy that family members and friends who cannot attend tonight are able to view the competition very live webcast. There's a camera behind there <laughs> capturing you. Uh, for those of you who use social media, please tweet, Instagram, Snapchat away. Please use the hashtag, hashtag UCLA Grad Slam, hashtag UCLA Grad Slam 2022, and Grad Slam. Hashtag grass slam. As you see here um, in front of me, there's a timer clock facing the stage. There will be a 10 seconds countdown to cue each speaker to start at the end of the 10 seconds. If the speaker goes beyond the three minutes limit, points will be deducted from their final score, beginning with a one point deduction at three minutes past three, at uh, three seconds past three minutes and one point has been taken for off for every two seconds, the speaker continues after that. So presenters, if you reach three minutes, stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> Between each presentation, the judges who are seated in the front row here, uh, Dinetna will introduce our judging panel shortly. We'll have about three minutes to complete their scorecards. During that time, I will be talking to each presenter so we can get to know each of them a little better. Just think about me giving you a sneak peek behind the scenes. After the last presenter, we'll take a 10 minutes break 
while our tabulation committee continues to score, continue, uh, totals the score and determine the winners. During the break, each of you would also be able to vote for your favorite presenter. You can vote online through your smartphones. Instructions will be posted after the last presenter. Even people watching live online can vote. Again, there's a camera behind. During the break, you're also welcome to stretch your legs, take a bio break, and watch and chat with our presenters. When we return, we will announce the winners, take some photos, and then we will all go back to the patio for a celebratory reception with food and drinks. Now I will turn you back to Dean Etna, who will introduce our panel of judges and get the competition started. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francis. Okay, and if I'm lucky, my glasses won't fog up this time. Um, so judges, you have a very fun and challenging job this evening, as you are going to hear some amazing presentations about fascinating research from many different fields. And you heard the criteria from Francis. It's, or from me, actually, earlier. Um, it's not about whether students are going to cure a disease or discover the latest archaeological find. It's about whether they can engage their audience and communicate, effectively presenting their research. So judges, as I announce your name, please stand, turn, and wave to the audience. Please remain standing until I've read all of your names. Audience, please hold your applause until I've read all of the names. Jerome Greenberg, Clinical Me Professor of Medicine, David Geffen School of Medicine, Alumni Biology 78. Charlie Steinmetz, Alumni Anderson School of Business, Management 77. Marissa Lopez, who is our Associate Dean in the Graduate Division and a professor in the um, Department of English. Um, Monroe Gordon, who is our Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs and Alumni Political Science, 93. And Kelly Wall, who is our Interim Assistant Dean for UCLA Summer Sessions. Big round of applause. Thank you so much, judges. We truly appreciate your involvement with Grad Slam and the time you're committing to doing this. Okay, the moment we've all been waiting for, it's time for the competition to begin. Um, please note that for tonight, we've obtained permission for our finalists to present without their masks on, only for the duration of their presentation. Everyone else must keep their masks on, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, so on to the first presentation. Um, so our first finalist is going to be Tony Boltz. Um, Tony is in human genetics, and she will be presenting on Can a Drop of Blood Predict Your Risk for Mental Illness? My research asks the question, can a drop of blood predict your risk for mental illness? DNA is the molecule that encodes genetic information in all living things. While across humans, the vast majority of our DNA sequence is identical, about only 0.1% of the sequence differs between any two people. It is these tiny differences that lead to the vast variety of unique traits that characterize and distinguish each of us, including things like height, eye color, or even susceptibility to mental illness. Research has uncovered specific spots throughout, the D, uh, throughout our DNA that are involved in disease, including psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or depression, which affects millions of people around the world. By knowing an individual's genetic code and knowing these variations in spots that lead to disease, we can estimate a person's genetic risk for that disease. In this example, the blue spots are the good or non-risk associated variants, while the red spots are the bad variants that can lead to disease. By adding up all the blue versus all the red variants, we can estimate a person's risk score. 
In this study, we collected blood samples from about 800 individuals, half of whom have been diagnosed with schizophrenia. By sequencing the DNA found within these blood samples, we can determine each individual's genetic code, the unique alphabet soup of A's, G's, C's, and T's that make up their DNA. By knowing each individual's genetic code and knowing the variations in spots that can lead to disease, we could estimate each person's risk score. The scores range from negative three to positive three, with those on the, lowest, on the negative end having the lowest risk for disease and those on the positive end having the highest risk for disease. I ordered the resulting scores from lowest to highest and split them up into 10 equal groups of 80, shown here as percentiles. I found that when comparing the individuals found in the highest percentile, they had about a 4.7 times greater risk for developing schizophrenia than those individuals in the bottom percentile. It was super exciting to see this because uh, the current methods of diagnosing schizophrenia relies on the onset of symptoms. My research is showing that we don't need to wait until it's too late. Given that computing these risk scores is still in such early stages, it's exciting to see the promise in its predictive power while we continue to make the necessary change improvements uh, for its eventual use in a doctor's office. The ultimate goal is to give people the option of taking a simple blood test which can tell you your genetic risk for a disease. Knowing your genetic risk can allow you to better prepare and make lifestyle changes that can help uh, lessen, delay, or even prevent the onset of symptoms. Thank you. Thank you for that fantastic presentation. Thank you. Yep. Um, I have a quick question for you. Sure. Um, when you're not doing science, because this sounds very above my head, <laughs> I'm an engineering student. Um, when you're not doing science, what would you be doing? I really enjoy spending time outside in nature, going on uh, hikes throughout, like in Los Angeles in particular, but also I, I live, uh, my family lives back in Florida, so there's plenty of nice like trails and beaches to, to check out in that area as well. Awesome. <laughs> Which of these um, sites that you visit um, or visited is your favorite? And tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, I would say probably my favorite is in the Florida Keys. Specifically, you can go kayaking through the mangrove forest. It's just really, really beautiful, and it's like always warm there. So it just makes for a very nice trip. <laughs> awesome. Now you make me feel like following you there. When else are you <laughs> going to go there? Um, cool. Um, so UCLA is a very beautiful campus, and yeah. you enjoy nature. Where yet at UCLA is your favorite spot? That's a tough one, but I think I would have to go with the area just outside the building where my lab is. Um, it's, I work in the Gonda building just across from here, and there's a nice courtyard, courtyard, courtyard out front. Um, and a lot of people like to just gather there for, you know, hanging out with each other. Some people sometimes bring like their dogs to play catch or something, and then there's also like a little cafe there. So it's just a really nice place to hang out and catch up with people and see others from other labs that you may not have seen in a while because of everything that's been going on with COVID. Yeah, sure, I agree. Um, I have this experience as a graduate student, I spend all of my time in the lab. When you close from work and you go home, what is the first thing that you do? First thing that I'll do is pet my cat Vinny because he's oh. usually <laughs> home by himself all day. <laughs> Um, and he's usually pretty lonely and gives me a nice little meow when I walk in the door. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, so uh, speaking of cats, um, which is your favorite? Like what kind of cats do you keep? Oh, he's just this one that we found at the shelter. He's oh, just the domestic so short hair, a mix of all sorts of different breeds. Um, he's just a sweet little guy. <laughs> nice, nice. It's nice chatting with you. And yes. um, I wish you all the very best. Thank you so much. Congratulations. <laughs>
Unfortunately, wastewater treatment today uses a lot of energy and resources. It generates a ton of solid waste, and sometimes it also releases chemicals such as nitrogen and phosphorus into our water bodies that make the water undrinkable and also harm marine life. The treatment process also produces greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide and methane that contribute to climate change. But don't despair just yet. In Dr. Mahendra and Dr. Hug's lab, we are focusing on converting this wastewater into clean water and clean renewable energy, all with the help of microalgae. Microalgae are microorganisms that can consume chemicals such as nitrogen and phosphorus. They breathe in carbon dioxide and get their energy from sunlight. Now methane, the other greenhouse gas I mentioned earlier, is also a renewable energy source. So when our microalgae breathe in the CO2, we end up getting purified renewable energy. In collaboration with members in my group, we're building a mini zero waste wastewater treatment plant in our lab that harnesses the power of nature, the power of microalgae to give us clean water, capture greenhouse gases, give us renewable energy, and convert solids waste into fertilizer. Waste to treasure, am I right? But wait, that's not all. There's more. Um, the second stage of my research actually focuses on building a larger pilot scale version of this lab scale treatment plant right here on campus. Don't worry, we're not going to be dealing with sewage right in front of Royce Hall. So I guess what's really unique about my research is that I actually get to see it being applied as a model for other universities in just the next few years. So if you happen to see something like this in the news or on campus, you'll know where you saw it first. Oh, and a quick reminder to think about microalgae the next time you flush. Thank you. Shtija? Hello. How soon is this going to be available? You know, I ask myself that like every day. <laughs> um, but hopefully in the next few years. Awesome. Uh, like she said, know you had, had it first at the grass slam. Uh, so Shatija, um, you're a triple brune, right? That is very true. Tell us, how does it feel like to be a triple brune? It feels like home. Brewing born, brewing bread, right? <laughs> nice. Um, any experience? You did say your dad graduated from UCLA, right? No, he did not. He, my dad is back home in India. Um, that's where I'm originally from. Awesome. Okay, cool. Good. Um, as I've taught that um, triple brune means... Everyone, my triple brune is... I did my bachelor's in biochemistry from here, and uh -huh. then I did my master's, um, and now my PhD in civil engineering. Well, I just wanted them to be very sure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone gets that. So she didn't inherit the triple brune. She worked for it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, so... What piece of advice um, would you give if you would you give to any graduate student uh, who wants to do your kind of research? Um, I don't know. Read a lot and really enjoy what you're passionate about. Um, I think that's pretty much all I do. <laughs> Read a lot and do what you're passionate about. Thank you so much. Um, one last question for you. Of course. Um, can I actually take the water from my, you know? my number two and a place, you know. You should come bring it to my lab. We're also in the engineering building and then maybe we can do something about that. Uh, do I get uh, task credit for that? <laughs> Just saying. Okay, cool. Um, science is interesting, mm -hmm. uh, but what you do after your lab is also very interesting. Do you mind telling us what you do for pastime when you're not um, converting that thing to potable water? Um, I like reading. I like hanging out, going to brunch in LA. <laughs> I'll probably do too much of that. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so very much. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think Francis is knocking it out of the park here. <laughs> um, all right. Thank you so much for that um, wonderful presentation. And our next finalist is Mary Jo Mada. 
Um, Mary Jo is in the education department and she will be talking about the science behind bad PowerPoints, why no one remembers what you said. Okay, here we go. Scholars have called many things the great equalizer of men. Life, love, the pursuit of happiness, but in my experience, one of the greatest equalizers is something we all have to do. Sit through bad PowerPoints. Judging by some of the looks on your faces, I think you know what I'm talking about. Some of you are professors who make them. Some of you are students who have to sit through them. The reality is poor instructional design is something that happens a lot. But there's a reality here, which is we don't have to design them the way that we do. Take this for example. This is basically my presentation in a nutshell. It's got all of the important and relevant vocabulary you'll need to know today from working memory to redundancy effect to cognitive load. By the way, my favorite color is red and I love Law & Order SVU. <sighs> okay, let's just take a breather. Give your minds a rest. Who heard uh, what my favorite TV show is? Uh, oh, some of you? Okay, but not all of you. So let's talk about this because what you just experienced was a phenomenon called cognitive load. See, our minds are like this bucket. And when they're having to take in different pieces of information, the bucket gets heavier and heavier and heavier because your working memory can only take so much in. More specifically, what you were experiencing just now was the redundancy effect. It's the concurrent presentation of verbatim speech, which I was doing, and text up on the slide. If you're trying to read the slide and I'm saying different words, then who are you supposed to pay attention to? Those things counterbalance each other. So what do we do to lighten the load? Well, in my research, one of the major things that I've seen can be super effective is when you just remove text from the slide altogether. Focus on using visual cues and the auditory explanation. Now, we know this is hard, but for many industries, it's actually quite simple. In fact, in the STEM space, for those of you that are in STEM, you guys have lots of different kinds of diagrams and graphs, and you've got a lot to work with. But what about something like social studies? Well, let's say that I'm a seventh grade social studies teacher, right? And I'm talking about the Declaration of Independence. Instead of just throwing a bunch of bullet points up there and talking about it at the same time, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna put 1776 on the screen, and surround it with a famous painting of the Founding Fathers signing the Declaration of Independence. And if you really, really, really can't get rid of text altogether, just try this. Pick one word, only one, and surround it with associated imagery. Then challenge the people that you're talking to to deduce the definition on their own. I think we all can agree, Oprah's pretty magnanimous. If you have any questions or thoughts, I'll be out there afterwards. I'm all eyes and ears. Thank you. Oh, do I keep this, sir? Fantastic. What's up? Mary Jo? Yeah. You'll be out there and I'll be your agent. Okay. <laughs> you know, you need to come to me to get her. Thank you so much for that. Um, Thank you. When you're not doing research and um, helping us uh, figure out our presentation, PowerPoints, and all of that, what would you be cut doing? Uh, well, I am, um, I'm a part-time EDD student, so I actually do have a full-time job. Um, I run a computer science education program for black and Latino Hispanic high school students. Um, but uh, do I have any free time? Not really. Um, when I do have free time, um, I like running in half marathons. Um, I, was, I ran the Las Vegas half marathon a couple weekends ago. And then I love exploring LA with my fiance, Dave Rodriguez over there. Hi, Dave. Hey, babe. You look great from up here. Cool. Um, I do understand you like comedy and you go to comedy shows. I love well. comedy, yes. All right, so you do need to tell us a joke then. Oh, God. You have the floor? <laughs> oh, geez. Wow, you're really putting me on the spot here, Francis. <laughs> um, wow, it's so funny. You know, when people say be funny, it's like I have absolutely nothing. Um, okay, can I tell a funny story? And sure. All right, so I used to be a sixth grade uh, science teacher in Houston, Texas. And one of the fun things about being a middle school science teacher is you get to teach sexual health. Didn't tell me that when I decided to take that role. Um, so one of the classes I was teaching about, you know, different topics. 
And one of my boys in the front asked me what an erection was. Um, and so I drew it up on the board and you know, went through the, uh, the motions that you do to describe it. And at the end of the class, apparently some kid went up to him and was like, dude, it's a boner. That's what she's talking <laughs> about. And I was like, okay, that's not the scientific vocabulary word, but sure, why not? Awesome. Thank you so very much. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, this, this is strictly PG-8. <laughs> I'm really happy I just said that on the live stream. Hey, everyone. <laughs> so who is your favorite comedian? Oh, man, my favorite comedian. Um, goodness. You know, there's a lot of them, I have to say. I think that my, I mean, Amy Schumer is definitely up there. I love her. Um, I also love Michelle Wolf. If you guys haven't watched her um, speech that she gave at the White House Press um, event, you should definitely check it out. Um, and then I'm also a sucker, really, for any, actually, female comedians in general. I'm a big fan of female comedians. Cool. So if anyone in the audience need a comedian to headline their show, or you need somebody to help you put your presentation slides together, <laughs> just come through, Francis, and I'll connect you to Mary Jo. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Terrific, thank you so much. Um, okay, so our next finalist is going to be Briley Lewis. Briley is in astronomy and astrophysics, and she will be talking about finding planets in a forest of speckles. For most of human history, we've wondered if there are planets beyond our solar system. It turns out there are. Almost every star, like our sun, has a planet around it. There are so many exoplanets that we've found, we've actually found 5,000 in the past two decades of observations. Most of these exoplanets, though, are so small and hard to see. So instead, we look at stars, which are much bigger and brighter. So most of the exoplanets we've found have been from looking at stars and inferring there's a small planet around it by little changes in the star's light. We do have one way to directly see planets themselves, though, known as direct imaging. This is a really hard thing to do, though. It's a very hard problem. It's like trying to see a tiny little firefly buzzing around the bright lights of Las Vegas from all the way here in Los Angeles. We can do this, though, with technology. The image on the screen here is an image of four real exoplanets, all bigger than Jupiter, around a star a little over 100 light years away. In order to take an image like this, we first need a really big telescope that can collect as much light as possible from that tiny, faraway firefly. Then we block out the big Las Vegas lights, the light of the star the planet is around. In the image here, you can see the center where the star is missing. This only gets us so far, though. Some of the light from that bright star gets past our defenses and leaves pesky dots of light in our images called speckles that get in the way of us finding planets. The image here is not data straight from a telescope. It's data that's been processed, meaning we use statistics to subtract away those leftover speckles and find the planets beneath. And that's where I come in. So for, most, for part of my thesis work, I have been working on new ways to better get rid of speckles in our images and find fainter planets. Remember, the more speckles we clean up, the fainter the planets we can find, the more Earth-like planets we can find. This is an example of what current data processing algorithms can do. After, you can clearly see this ring, which is actually dust that's working on forming planets. Algorithms like this only use information about where speckles are in the image, though. And we know that speckles move with time, too. So I've been working on an upgraded algorithm that uses that inf extra information about how speckles change with time in order to do a better job removing them. Right now, with direct imaging, we've only found about 50 of the biggest exoplanets there are. But we want to find those fainter Earth-like exoplanets in order to someday search for alien life. Improving our technology, like with my upgraded speckle removing algorithm, is really our necessary next step towards finally answering that fundamental question, are we alone? Thank you.
Bradley. Hello. Thank you. Um, do you think we have any UFO out there around? Uh, yeah. I, so I've always been wondering. <laughs> this is the question like you, that, you know, everyone asks every astronomer on an airplane, right? It's like, are there actually aliens you would know? So my answer is, you know, space is so big that the likelihood of there being something out there is pretty high. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, space is so big that it'd be pretty hard for us to find out about it. So, okay, yeah. so it's like, uh, which comes first, the chicken or the egg, <laughs> right? Um, if there's any favorite item, let's pretend there's, there's life out there uh, for once. What favorite item would you take to space if you need to visit somebody there? Oh, if I, mean, I not could? Not the astronauts and, and all those folks, those fancy guys living there. If I have to travel anywhere for a long time, I have to have my dog. I cannot leave anywhere without him. <laughs> I don't know if he'd like space. That's so sweet. <laughs> he doesn't even like elevators, but. <laughs> cool. When you're done with research, let's, let's switch gears. When you're done with research and you're done with graduate life, what would you want to do? Yeah, so I would love to teach at a four-year university specifically to actually talk about interdisciplinary topics like science writing. Um, so in addition to being a grad student, I'm also a freelance science writer, and I teach courses for undergrads through the Clusters program about science writing and actually teaching people how to read about science and talk about science, um, since that really makes you know, the world better for everyone if we can all learn and talk about science more. Cool, cool. I'll give you free publicity. So your article can <laughs> get you. a lot of likes and ticks. Uh, do you mind sharing with us where we can find any of your writings? Uh, yeah, I actually just published uh, my first article in Scientific American last week. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, <laughs> and I have, a, I have a website that has a lot of my writing on it. So right, go ahead, tell them name. the website. <laughs> you have my blessings. It's literally just my name, briley lewiscom Oh, it's not up there. <laughs> Check, look out. Uh, Bridie, thank you so very much. Thank and you. I wish you all the very best. Thank just you. Just make sure you take me along when you're going to space. I can try. <laughs>
For example, the planets in our own solar system are divided into two distinct subgroups. The presence of the close-in small planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and the outer giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, could be evidence that these two classes have a positive correlation. But does this pattern exist in other systems? I'm currently conducting a survey to address this knowledge gap by searching for distant giants, using the radial velocity technique, in systems where a close-in small planet has already been detected by the transit method. I've detected 10 new giant planets already, and at the end of my survey, I'll be able to put constraints on the relationship between close-in small planets and distant giants. This is an exciting result. With it, I will be able to determine how Earth-like planets form, bringing us closer to understanding our own solar system and the potential for life beyond it. Thank you. Judah. Yes. That's a good presentation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> uh, so you talked about the relationship between this giant planet and the little ones. That's right. Is this the kind of relationship between uncle and nephew? <laughs> you might say that, yeah. You might say that each little nephew Earth-like planet has a big uncle Jupiter outside, or at least that we're looking for. Mm. That's right. Just a back, sto back uh, story to that. Um, Judah is um, an, un an uncle to a three-year-old nephew. Tell us about your nephew. That's right. So uh, I was just out in Colorado a little while ago visiting my brother. Um, on December 7th, I believe it was, uh, he and his wife had their first child, who is also my first nephew. Cutest little guy I've ever seen in my life. Uh, I almost didn't want to come back, almost missed the flight, but um, unfortunately I had to tear myself away, but it was awesome to see him. Super cool. cute, yeah. Cool. Um, like I asked Bradley if you're not doing space because I'm like, oh, space again. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's some high tech explanation there. Uh, so if you're not doing space research, um, what would you be doing? Oh, let's see, when I'm not doing space research. On a good day, what would you be caught doing if you're not looking for what is out there? Definitely. Well, I guess this is kind of a cheat answer in a way because sometimes when I'm not doing professional astronomy, you know, as a grad student, I'll bust out my own little, you know, amateur telescope and take it out to, you know, some maybe mountain or out in Joshua Tree or something and find some dark sky just to look at stuff myself. I can't see stuff as cool as what's up here, you know, detecting uh, planets in other systems. I can detect planets in our own solar system, though. Sometimes I can see Jupiter. Um, sadly, people found that before I did, but uh, it still looks cool. Looks just as cool as ever. You can see the moons. So, yeah, I really enjoy doing that. Amateur astronomy, but other than that, uh, yeah, watching TV, hanging out with my lovely girlfriend right over there. <laughs> She's going to hate me later. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right, awesome. Thank you so much, and um, I wish you all the very best. Great, thank you very much. Oops, is that on? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, okay, our next finalist is Brandon Sai. Um, Brandon is from Human Genetics, and he will be talking about breaking the rules to fight cancer. Several months ago, I lost one of my research mentors, Dr. John Phillip, to cancer. He was a cancer doctor and researcher, but he lost the battle against the very disease he was trying to cure. In his image, I'm an aspiring physician scientist, working to fight cancer both as a doctor and behind the scenes as a researcher. My research focuses on using your own immune system to fight cancer. If I were to ask you, what does your immune system do? How many of you would say it fights off bugs like bacteria and viruses? Yeah, you'd all be correct. That's what I would say too. But let me reframe how you think about your immune system. Your immune system distinguishes things as self or non-self. Bacteria and viruses fall under the non-self category, which is what allows the immune system to eliminate them. But what about cancer? 
Cancer actually originates from your own cells that have broken the rules of your body and grow more than they are supposed to. So ultimately, they're considered self, and that presents some problems when the immune system tries to eliminate cancer. Think of your immune system as a police car. Your own cells have a stop sign that says, stop, don't come to eliminate me, I am not a threat, I am self. And so the police car, when it sees a stop sign, has to press on its brakes. Rules are rules, right? But if cancer can break the rules of your body, why can't we? Who says we have to play fair against cancer? So let's break these rules. We can remove the stop sign so the car doesn't stop, goes to the cancer, and kills it. Or we can remove the brakes so the car doesn't stop and goes to the cancer and kills it. We call these approaches checkpoint inhibition, and they've been shown to work in some, but not all types of cancer. And so as a researcher, I have to ask, why does this sometimes work and sometimes doesn't? My research looks at the genes of thousands and thousands of patients and tries to identify which genes are responsible for dictating this phenomenon. By using this information, I can develop algorithms that predict which cancer patients will respond favorably to which type of cancer therapy. There is no such thing as a one-size-fits-all therapy for cancer. But I work in this field so that one day, when I'm a doctor, I can tell my patients, don't worry, we have a cure. And depending on your individual genes, that cure may be your own immune system. This talk is in honor of everyone who has been impacted by cancer. Thank you. Brandon, thank yeah. you so much for uh, that noble research. You know, um, yeah. it's very needed. It's much needed, and uh, thank you for doing that. Yeah. Um, I have a quick question for you. Don't tell the DMV I said that. Is it okay to remove the stop sign and the brake at the same time? And like just I <laughs> ram into that thing. Like I said, we don't have to play fair against cancer because. Cancer often isn't fair and takes lives sooner than we would like. Cool. Um, let's move away from research a little bit. Tell us any fun fact about yourself. Yeah, so um, fun fact about me, um, as I said before, and I'm, I'm an MD-PhD student, and I actually lead the dance team at the David Geffen School of Medicine. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, the dance team is called M Divas, and <laughs> MD for doctor, and then M Divas because we dance, I guess. <laughs> but it's, it's a really awesome group of students, um, and it's, it's super fun and super rewarding, and I, I love to dance and entertain the crowds. And you heard him, he loves to. <laughs> so uh, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but do you have any cool moves? <laughs> oh my <laughs> god. Something. <laughs> I somehow knew this was coming. <laughs> um, okay. Something cool. cool. Move. I guess I can teach a move. One of my favorite dance styles is called whacking, um, which is, you know, movement of the arms, flicking of the wrist. But I like to describe it as, when I teach people how to whack, I like to describe it as throwing a bowling ball, and then once you hit parallel to the ground, you bend your elbow in, and then you flick your wrist, and then bring it back out, and then go in other directions, and do all of this stuff. Isn't that cool? <laughs> and that's whacking. <laughs> cool. So how do you make time for dancing and medical research? I mean, you're a pretty busy person. Yeah. Is my PI here? No? OK. <laughs> Great. Uh, no. Um, you know, I like to go out and take dance classes in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is actually the birthplace of hip hop dance, which is the style of dance that I kind of uh, am familiar with. So it's really cool to be able to dance in like this, uh, the origin place of hip hop dance. So it's, it's, really, it's really nice. I agree with you. And it's cool to know that you can actually do medical science at UCLA and still dance. So hey, it's fun. Brandon, good luck. Thank you.
We'll have to get you to come to grad division and do a, a lunchtime dance, uh, dance class for us. Um, OK, thank you so much. Um, all right, our next finalist is uh, Shruti Inbureson. And um, Shruti is in civil engineering. And she is going to be talking about wetlands and wildfires, how microbes maintain balance. Imagine it's wildfire season. You're switching between staring at your phone for evacuation and air quality warnings and out the window at a hazy orange sunset. Oh, and you're casually maintaining the balance of elements on Earth. Wait, what? Well, that's the role of the microbial super team, and wildfires could threaten their balance. So what exactly is going on? First of all, what is nutrient cycling? Nutrients are elements key to life on Earth, and they are rearranged constantly throughout the environment. So, nitrogen in the atmosphere can be transformed by bacteria in the soil, and then that fixed nitrogen can be used to build a plant, such as the crops that make up our food. That's right, the fancy delicious food we ate out there came from the atmosphere. Crazy, right? When plants and animals die, they return their nutrients back to the earth, allowing microbes to recycle it for new life to grow. Wildfire pollution changes the availability of nutrients, such as nitrogen and sulfur. They also change the compounds in which they're found, and some microbes like their nutrients in different forms than others. So wildfires can make it such that some microbes utter an endless Vegas buffet, while others are scrounging for leftovers. Wetlands are a particularly interesting ecosystem since they are one of the largest emitters of methane, a potent greenhouse gas. Furthermore, sulfur cycling microbes can actually consume methane, keeping them out of the atmosphere. However, there aren't a lot of studies that look into the effects of wildfires and wetlands, and that's where my research comes in. Our lab has obtained wetland samples from the Bayona wetlands and wildfire residues from the Palisades fire. I plan to conduct experiments that model what happens when stormwater deposits these wildfire residues into these delicate microbial communities. First, I will measure the amount and type of nitrogen and sulfur compounds cycled by these microbes, and then I'll look closer for a molecular explanation seeing how the levels of gene expression in these microbes affect their ability to adapt in real time. All species do this. Our cells and genetic material have an amazing ability to detect their surroundings and alter the type and scale of response they produce. It's like dressing for the weather, but on a molecular level. This research can help us better understand how microbes maintain balance in the face of climate change. Humans have already played with the balance of Earth's nutrients, like a high-stakes game of Jenga, and deforestation, droughts, and global warming are only going to make wildfires more intense and more frequent, amplifying their effects. If we can understand the effect of wildfires on this key wetland ecosystem, then we can engineer the future of environmental technology, stormwater filters in the environment that prevent the wildfire pollution from getting to the microbial super team in the first place, allowing them to do their job to maintain balance and combat climate change. Microbes assemble. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No doubt we need this. The world needs this uh, more than ever now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, right. it's been a day, hasn't it? Yep. OK. Um, so you enjoy doing research in, on um, environmental topics and all of that. And I do know you said um, you're interested in making policies that would make um, for sustainable environment and all of that. If you have that m magic wand and you can make all of the presidents in the world effect one policy change, what would that be? I think it would just be holding people accountable. Too often the biggest problem is that people causing these environmental problems are able to get away with it and they know, can, and they know they're able to get away with it. So I think step one is, I mean, 100 corporations are responsible for 71% of greenhouse gas emissions. So if we let those 100 corporations know that there are going to be consequences if they continue to ruin our planet, then maybe they'll start acting in a way that will protect our future. Mm. Sorry, that wasn't the most lighthearted answer. but Perfect. Thank you. Um, 
when you're not making policies um, to make the environment sustainable and you're not doing research, what would you be fun doing? Uh, I would probably uh, be recipe testing. Um, yeah, I love, I love trying out new recipes. I try to spend more time in nature. I got to take some of my lab mates to the botanical garden for the first time, and it was just, it was so much fun. Okay, am I allowed to join this team because I like food? <laughs> I love food. Uh, so you talked about recipe. What's your favorite recipe? Do you want to share your favorite recipe with us? Uh, yeah, so I guess the most recent thing that I made was some chocolate orange cupcakes. I used oranges from the farmer's market because it's citrus season and they're really good right now. Um, sort of love that whole tart chocolate combination. Um, but also, my parents are amazing cooks. They like make really good Indian food. I try to be half the people they are. <laughs> okay, I like to ask this question every time. Mm -hmm. Potatoes or bread? <laughs> I, I mean, I gotta go with bread. Why? I know that it's, because I guess just in terms of, I love making focaccia, and I love, I just, I like bread because it's, I don't know, potatoes are cool too. That is a tough question. <laughs> but I think most recently, I've had a lot of fun with focaccia because you can sort of, you make the dents in it for the olive oil to sit, but also you can get out all your stress on the dough. Mm -hmm. We should continue this conversation. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, okay, our next finalist is Elizabeth Burnett. And Elizabeth is in neuroscience, and she will be talking about what E. coli endotoxin can tell us about addiction. Alcohol use disorder is the most common form of addiction. Whether we've seen it on TV or actually lived it, I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with the effects that this disorder can have. But just to put it in perspective a little bit, the World Health Organization estimates that alcohol consumption is responsible for nearly 6% of all deaths worldwide. And in the US alone, 93 million adults, which is approximately a third of us, have or will meet criteria for an alcohol use disorder at some point in our lives. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about the relationship between alcohol use and inflammation. These are thought to kind of feed into each other. So humans and animals that drink more have much higher levels of inflammation in their brain and body compared to their more lighter drinking counterparts. And the reverse has been seen in animals as well. If you artificially increase inflammation in a mouse model, it makes the mouse want to drink more alcohol. But this hasn't been seen in humans yet, and that's where this experiment comes in. I'm going to be giving a group of heavy drinkers a low dose of endotoxin, a bacteria derived from E. coli, to artificially induce inflammation. And the effects you might see with this endotoxin are kind of similar to what you might get with a mild cold or flu. So a headache, nausea, or fever. And this is all part of the body's natural immune response. I know, kind of mad science, right? But the great thing about using this method is that it's a low dose, so it's very safe, it's controlled, and the effects wash out of the body within about four hours. So we can effectively induce this temporary, low-grade immune response and look at its effects on behavior in half of our participants who get the endotoxin versus the other half who get placebo. So what does endotoxin actually do in people with alcohol use disorder? I'm interested in their response to alcohol cues, and this can be measured in two ways. Behaviorally, I'll have them hold interact with and smell a glass of their favorite alcoholic beverage, as well as a glass of water as a controlled comparison, and they'll rate their alcohol craving on a series of questionnaires. Biologically, I'm also interested in their neural response. While they're in an MRI scanner, I'll show them images of alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages and look at their brain activation in regions that are related to reward processing. The hypothesis here is that people who receive endotoxin will crave alcohol more and will have greater reward circuit activation compared to those that get placebo. And we also think this will correlate with levels of immune biomarkers in the blood. So when they're at their highest level of inflammation, we expect them to feel the worst and crave alcohol the most. Overall, the goal with this study is to shed some light on the specific role that inflammation plays in alcohol use. Despite how prevalent this disorder is, it's still severely undertreated. 
So it's my hope that eventually results from this study will help us develop new medications targeting the immune system to help people recover from alcohol addiction. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, again, what would you say uh, potential applications of your research um, would be like, can we use this in the pharmaceutical industry? What other industries? So I definitely this? wouldn't recommend giving people a little bit of E. coli as a treatment. Okay. This is kind of okay. to make things worse and see what actually happens when we make people more inflamed, but that's not the goal. That's not the end goal. We want to eventually reduce inflammation in people to help them actually overcome alcohol addiction. Okay. Thank you. Um, and when you graduate, what would you like to do? Would you want to continue this research, work in the industry, work in policy? Honestly, I'm really undecided. I'd love to continue doing at least clinical research in some capacity. I love interacting with humans and doing things that have a direct medical translation, um, but I'm not entirely sure. Hmm. Okay. Uh, fair enough. I mean, we all take time sometimes. Got to a little bit of time to decide. It took me a while to even know I want to come to grad school. Um, tell us any fun fact about you. Oh, fun fact about me. Um, so I am actually an internet ordained minister. Ooh. And uh, I have performed a wedding at a Comic Con. <laughs> Did, Did not get it? paid for it. It was completely for fun. But uh, yeah, these people posted on a Facebook group for the convention, said they were getting married. Did anyone know of a minister that would do the ceremony on short notice? And I was like, I'll do it. <laughs> I ordained myself on the on internet. So yeah. How do I get it? Uh, it sounds like a cool job. You literally, you just Google it. It takes like half an hour, probably less. They just email you your certificate at the end. It's Oh. ridiculously easy. Nice. What's the name of this organization? The organization? Um, there's a bunch of them. There's a bunch. Um, I think the one that I did it through was like Universal Life Church or something like that, but there's a ton. They're all over the place. Okay. All right. I'd remember this when I went to get married. Yeah, you know, add some extra credentials to the end of your name after the PhD. Cool. <laughs> all right. Thank you so very much. And um, Thank you. I wish you all the best. You all know uh, how to reach Elizabeth if you want to get married. <laughs> all right, so our next to last finalist is Paul Vander. Um, Paul is in molecular, cellular, and integrative physiology, and he will be talking to us about suspended animation as medicine, science or fiction. <laughs> In the US, more than 5 million people are admitted to the ICU each year, and 20 to 40% of these patients will require mechanical ventilation in order to stay alive. During the COVID-19 pandemic, this demand for ICU beds and ventilators has increased even further, with, five, with more than 5,000 COVID-19 patients currently in ICUs across the country, most of which will end up needing mechanical ventilators in order to survive. The need for mechanical ventilators in these patients reflects that they are in a state where their body's demands for oxygen are unmet due to the failure of the respiratory and or circulatory system to meet these needs. While traditional strategies to increase the supply of oxygen to the body, such as mechanical ventilation, can be, effect can be effective, these approaches are highly invasive and require specialized equipment that is often not available or in short supply. Now I want you to imagine a new treatment strategy, where rather than increasing the supply of oxygen to the body, we could instead drastically reduce the amount of oxygen needed by the body in order to survive. 
This possibility has captured the imagination of science fiction filmmakers for decades, in which they have imagined scenarios in which a state of suspended animation can be induced for deep space travel, such as in the movie Alien from 1979, and more recently in the movie Passengers in 2016. This state of suspended animation is not exclusive to the world of science fiction, however, and numerous species of mammals have evolved the ability to naturally enter a state of suspended animation, where their core body temperature can drop to as low as 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and their oxygen consumption can decrease by nearly 90% without any apparent side effects. In mice, this state of suspended animation is known as torpor, and in my research, I study how the brain controls this state. To start, I wanted to understand how activity in the brain changes during torpor. To gain this information, I took a group of mice and collected their brains while they were in torpor, and I then looked for markers of activity across the brain. During this state of suspended animation, I expected that most brain regions would be inactive, which is indeed what I observed. But there was one brain region, which I identified as the preoptic area, that was lit up with activity, as you can see from the green dots in this image. The preoptic area is present in the brains of both mice, shown above, and in humans, shown below, with the preoptic area indicated by the blue ovals. Based on these results, I can conclude that the preoptic area is likely critical for the control of torpor in mice, and that it might hold the key for inducing a similar state of suspended animation in humans. My ongoing research is continuing to evaluate this exciting possibility working towards the larger goal of using suspended animation in medical practice as an alternative to mechanical ventilation. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for that, uh, that presentation. Thank how much, you. growing up, how much of um, sci-fi movies did you see? Uh, quite a few. Uh, there's quite a few that use this sort of technology, too. So it's really exciting to think that like, the work that I'm doing could potentially be making this a reality at some point. Nice. Would yeah. you encourage and advise any parents here to allow their children, their kids to see a lot of sci-fi movies? Because it looks to me like the investment paid off in your case. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty simple. Just like manipulate their preoptic area, just like go in and poke around in their brain, and they'll, they'll go into go into a state of suspended animation. So, and all serious, no, there are no currently human clinical trials for this sort of work. Um, but there are a lot of like preclinical pre -clinical studies using animal models that are underway. Mm. Excellent. And um, tell us a little bit about your PI. How, would you like to trade places with your PI for a day? <laughs> um, so my PI, hi Stephanie, if you're watching. Um, I, I, I have a lot of admiration for my PI. She's, she's given me a lot of freedom with this work. Um, to really like explore the different areas of, of how torpor is regulated in the brain. Um, so I mean, I mean, yeah, if you want, if you want to trade places, trade salary, Stephanie. I'm, <laughs> I'm all for it. So, yeah, I'll tell you why I asked. Um, I, I just wanted to know if um, your PI as well see a lot of sci-fi movies. Um, I'm not sure actually. That'd be a question to uh, to ask Maybe her. Maybe like during your group meetings, do you play one? Do you? Um, no, I haven't actually. But that's actually a good idea for our next lab meeting. So I'll I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Yeah. So. Because um, you who knows. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I have a question for you. Actually, you've been you've been asking all the questions sure, today. Sure. <laughs> what What do you do when you're not hosting the the grad slam at UCLA? That's a very good question. I spend my time actually playing soccer on the intramural uh, field. That's probably the sanest place for me here at UCLA because I'm so involved in the GSA and do, I do research. And so if I need to get some clarity, I just go play fit soccer with um, some staff and students. Yep. All right. Awesome. And I have one last question for you. Oh. Tell us any fun fact about yourself. Fun fact. Um, fun fact. Um, I've started mountain biking since I come to LA, so that's one of the things that, that I do when I'm not in the lab. Um, so if I'm not in the lab, just, just look for me on, uh, in West Ridge Canyon. So, <laughs> yeah. Good luck, Paul. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, so last but not least, um, our final finalist for the evening is Kelsey Rutledge. And Kelsey is in biology, and she will be talking about the fluid dynamics of smell, a stingray's perspective. Smell is a potent wizard that can transport you across thousands of miles in all the years you have lived. Helen Keller. We can all relate to the power of smell, the power to set us at ease, or as Keller said, transport us back to a moment in time. For me, it's the smell of my Nana's house or rain in the mountains of Asheville, North Carolina. While we can all recognize smell's influence, as humans, smell isn't our primary sense for how we navigate the world around us. But for fish, it is. Imagine being the skate, a relative of the stingray, in the deep ocean, using your sense of smell to find food, mates, and even warn you of incoming danger. This is the world these fish live in, and they have evolved one of the most acute noses in the animal kingdom. Just how sensitive are they? Up to 100,000 times more than us. That's better than the best canine detection dog. As a group, they also have the most diversity and nose shape and size of any other group of fish. Here's an up-close image of their nostrils. See those two little holes and flap-like structures? And while we know this fish has an excellent sniffer, we don't know how they actually smell, the mechanism. You see, a fish's nose isn't connected to their throat. It isn't involved in breathing, and there's no pump for bringing odor into the nose. On top of that, we don't know why they have so many different types of noses. My PhD research at UCLA aimed to explore exactly that. Why are their noses so weird, and why do we care? Well, this isn't only interesting from an evolutionary biologist's point of view, but from a design standpoint. An efficient odor sensing device that doesn't require the power of a pump, this could be a great model for artificial sniffers in water or air. Imagine having the power to sniff out military threats, pollution, and even check for air and water quality. To answer these questions, I worked with biologists, engineers, museum staff, and even researchers with the US Navy. I then created anatomically accurate models of stingray heads by 3D printing CT scans. Then, using high-powered lasers to illuminate all these tiny particles in water, we can visually see the fluid dynamics of odor capture and watch those green particles go into the nose. And what did we find? That not all noses are created equal. Some are better than others, more dynamic. This one, with the weird flaps, helps this animal capture odor faster. These designs are simple, innovative, and can be easily incorporated into new technology by simply mirroring this shape. The results of this research is already shaping the designs of the new underwater technology at the Navy. Think underwater vehicles that can detect harmful chemicals in water. So the next time you're transported back in time by your favorite smell, I hope you remember stingrays, and more importantly, how we can look to nature for innovative solutions. Thank you. That's an excellent and beautiful presentation. Thank you. I actually brought um, the 3D printed. These are examples of the stingray heads. <laughs> so if you want to see them laughter, let me know. Thank you. Oh, Do you want to see? <laughs> yeah. That's the head, and these are the eyes. And then the mouth and the nose are on the underside. And this is the nose with those flap-like structures. This is another one that looks really different. So beautiful. <laughs> so beautiful. I, I mean, I, I'm a material scientist, and I know how important this kind of research uh, is, because like you said, it guides you to look at nature and then develop something that could be used um, for, to make life better. Uh, exactly. And I want to assume you've, you've done, you'd probably know much more about stingrays than <laughs> the nose. So tell us any trivial or fun facts about stingrays. Oh gosh, well there's so many. And it, uh, you have the floor. <laughs> um, yeah, well one of my previous research is actually looking at the biomechanics of the crushing power of jaws of stingrays. So there's this um, specific stingray that lives in the Amazon River and it's speckled and some people have it in an aquarium. So you might, if you have a pet stingray, this is the, probably the one you have. But their jaws are made of cartilage. 
so they're not made of bone. So they're fairly weak compared to bones, but they're able to crush material that's harder than their actual jaws. So um, one previous study I did was looking at how they're actually physically able to crush something that's harder than their own skeleton. That's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Um, when you're studying stingrays and um, you know, doing research, what would you be fun doing? Yeah, I like swimming, I like scuba diving, I like drawing and hanging out with my dog, my corgi. <laughs> yeah. Nice. And I understand you'll be graduating very soon, right? Yes, I'll be graduating this year. At, uh, graduate school. Um, I'll be joining the Debiri Lab at Caltech, where I'll be working on biohybrid robot jellyfish. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, Kelsey. It was nice talking to you, and I wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So let's give these students one more big round of applause and congratulate them on a job well done. And thank you so much, Francis, for doing such a great job interviewing our candidates. You're wonderful at this. Um, and I just wanted to add sort of a personal note. I just found all of your presentations outstanding. Um, I, they were uh, just really inspirational, not just that you had such brilliant research, um, you were able to articulate, you know, what you did and how it's going to impact our world. Um, I'm also very impressed by how courageous all of you are. So I was noting to Charlie Steinmetz earlier that I think when I was in graduate school, I'm not sure I would have been brave enough to do this. And I know it takes a lot to come up here and put yourself out here. And, um, and you all really just did such a wonderful job. And we are super proud to have you as part of our Bruin family. So thank you to all of you. Okay, um, it is now time for the audience choice voting. Um, so may I ask that you please turn your attention to the screen, take out your smartphones if you have one, um, follow the directions and vote for your favorite speaker. Um, very important, you will only be able to vote once, so please vote carefully because you can't take it back. Once you've placed your vote, please feel free to chat and take a break. Um, just a reminder, we are going to have a full reception with really great food right outside immediately following the presentation of the awards. Um, we highly encourage you to um, enjoy the refreshments on the patio. Um, otherwise, you need to keep your masks on indoors unless you are actively eating or drinking. And we're now going to take a five minute break while our team tabulates the judges scorecards and you place your audience choice votes. Thank you.
Okay, I hate to break this up because everybody's having a really good time, but we'll have an even better time when the awards are all over and we'll be able to go outside and eat and drink and, uh, and keep talking as long as you like. Um, so welcome back, everyone. Um, we are first going to start by acknowledging and celebrating all of our graduate student contestants tonight by presenting each of them with a Grad Slam 2022 finalist certificate. I'd like to invite Graduate Division Chief of Staff and Chief Financial Officer Kristen McKinney to the podium to announce the names. And Francis, can you please join me on stage to present the certificates? Um, when Kristen calls your name, please join Francis and me on stage to get your certificate, stop for a photo, and then return to your seat. everyone. Um, we'll go ahead and announce the, um, all of our finalists in presentation order. So first up is Tony Boltz. <laughs> Shatija Shaw. Mary Jo Maada. <laughs> Briley Lewis. <laughs> Judah Van Zant. Brandon Sai, Shruti in the Racin, Elizabeth Burnett. Paul Vander. And Kelsey Rutledge. All righty. Congratulations to all of our finalists. I now have the pleasure of announcing the audience choice, third, second, and first place awards. It's not quite the envelope from the Oscars, but you know, it works, it works, okay. It also wasn't delivered by Armored Vehicle, but it was delivered by our lovely Grad Division staff, so that's even better, in my opinion. Alrighty, so starting with the audience choice award. Um, the Audience Choice Award winner is Paul Vander from Molecular, Cellular, and Integrative Physiology. <laughs> Again, the Audience Choice Award is a $1,000 uh, fellowship award. They don't get to take the big check home, unfortunately, Aww. but. <laughs> okay, in third place with a $200,000 fellowship. <laughs> Sorry, 2,000. <laughs> my bad. Sorry, it's after my bedtime. No, <laughs> 2,000. Sorry, my reading error. I need some some glasses. Is Mary Jo Maada from Education? <laughs> Thank you. 
All right. See if I can get the amount right on this one. Okay. In second place with a $3,000 fellowship is Elizabeth Burnett from Neuroscience. All right, and the one you've all been waiting for, our first place winner, the 2022 UCLA Grad Slam champion who will be winning a $5,000 fellowship and representing UCLA at the UC-wide Grad Slam competition in San Francisco in May is Kelsey Rutledge from Biology. <laughs> Alrighty. Congratulations to all the winners and to all of our finalists. Let's give our outstanding scholars one more big round of applause. Thank you so much. That was very exciting. <laughs> um, this concludes our formal program for the evening. Um, awardees, please stick around while we capture some pictures of each of you here on, your st on stage with your trophies. And judges, please stay for some group photos as well. Everyone else, please make your way out to the patio for a celebratory reception in honor of these fine students and their outstanding research. The finalists, judges, and hosts We'll be taking photos outside at the step and repeat immediately following this. You're more than welcome to use the step and repeat once they are done. Thank you so much again for joining us this evening. See you out there, everybody.